بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده تعالى ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We stopped last week in the discussion of Riyah showing off and this is in the middle of the third chapter where Shaykh al-Islam titles the chapter Fear of Shirk. And we spoke about why he titled the chapter this way and why it came after the discussions about the virtues of the Shahada and its excellences. As a type of reminder that just as there are virtues for the Tawheed, that a Muslim should be between hope and fear. There should also be a fear of Shirk, lest that this person be deceived by this great virtue and not do the necessary actions and precautions to avoid that which will nullify the actions. So we know if someone falls into shirk, he or she will nullify the good deeds. Allah he says in the Quran, لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَرُكَ That if you commit shirk of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even you, then you will lose all your good deeds. So shirk itself is something to be feared, for it's dangerous. And so then we moved into the discussion of riya. And last week we talked about riya and we defined it. Anyone remembers the definition of riya? Showing off, what does it mean? Um, doing something yeah. and not completely for Allah, and it has to be related to worship. Tayyip, so when somebody does an action that should be dedicated or devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that person then does it for another person, other than Allah, either completely or partially. Right? And we mentioned that, riya, it means that when somebody is doing something to be seen. And another type of riyah is when someone does something in order for that message, that action to be heard by others. Right? This is sama'a or sum'a. And this is a type of riyah. And now we're going to get into part where Shaykh uh, al-Islam, or Sayyid ibn Uthaymeen, Allah ibn Uthaymeen, he talks about the differences and different categories of riyah. He says, Rahimahullah, showing off is divided into two, based on, in terms of nullification of worship. So we know when someone commits riyah and ibadah, that ibadah is batil, it's nullified, it's void. So there are two types, or two categorizations in relation to that. It means if someone commits riyah and ibadah, is it all nullified? Is it partially nullified? Is it always nullified? The so first is, when it forms the basic reason for carrying out the action of worship. That is, when he stood up worshiping only to show off. The action of such is null and void. Rejected to him based on the hadith of Abu Huraira. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So he says the first type is when somebody does an ibadah solely for other than Allah. That action in its entirety is ibadah, it's nullified and void. Means a person is worshipping other than Allah. And so he's not doing the action for Allah and then changing his intention for others. He's getting up to do salah or getting up to do an ibadah just for someone else. So that one is nullified because it's shirk. There's no ibadah in there. You've given the ibadah to someone else. And we mentioned last week that, the, that, that when we talk about riyah, that it doesn't necessitate that someone has to do it this way. When we say riyah, it can be when you do an action for Allah, and then during that action you change to your intention or part of it to other than Allah. But if someone does something solely for someone else, other than Allah, then this is void. Or this is worshipping other than Allah. And Hadith Abu Hurairah and Sahih Muslim, the Prophet wasallam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I am most undeserving to have a partner joined with me in worship. Whoever doesn't act uh, uh, worship and joins a partner with me, then his action, I will abandon him in his action. That I am the most unneeding, undeserving of having associates and partners to live with me. That if someone will turn to an action for Allah, it's supposed to be for Allah, but he does it for someone other than Allah, Allah says, I'll abandon him and his action. So the action is rejected, تَرَقْتُهُ I'll abandon him, وَالشِّرْكَ So that the shirk is, that action is shirk, and number two is batil, it doesn't count. So the second one, 
So that's the first one. The second type is when someone shows off during the an act of worship that's intended for Allah. So you're doing it for Allah, but in there then you change or part of your intention, a part of the act is done for other than Allah, or it's done for Allah and at the same time for other than Allah. So meaning that the worship is basically for Allah, but you show off suddenly it comes to you. Right? So it, it, you didn't intend it. So in this situation, the second category, then this one breaks into two more categories. So this is what we want to focus on. For most people, Alhamdulillah, when they worship Allah, they're trying to seek Allah's pleasure. You know, we want to worship Allah to accept our deeds. Man kana, well, man kana yarjuliqa Rabbi. Whoever wants to meet his Lord Subhanahu wa Taala, for yamin amal saliha, to let him act a righteous good deed. And the two conditions of the good deeds: number one, that it has to be mukhris, it has to have ikhlas, and number two, it has to be ala. Sunnah to Rasulullah Mutabah to Rasulullah Sallam. So some most of us, we are intending our actions for Allah, and so we get up to pray salah, or we get up to do any of these good deeds like charity. But then in there something happens, right? And, and this riya may come to us. So Sheikhs, in this case, there are two categorizations. Number one, when he so this is a categorization and number the second time. So number one, when he repels it, then it will not affect him. It will not affect him. For example, after someone had observed the unit of a prayer, raka'ah of prayer, and some people joined in the second raka'ah, then he crossed his mind that he should prolong the rukur, and prolong the prostration, or that he should pretend to be crying, or the likes of this, and then he repels it. Then it will not affect him, since he's making a struggle against it. So the first category situation, when somebody is praying, for example, salah, then the riyah comes to him. Because somebody joined the salah, now he's the imam. Should I make my ruku a longer sujood? Should I cry in the All these things are coming to him. So he pushes them, he deflects them. So in case of this, when he deflects it, then it's not considered. It won't nullify his actions. Alhamdulillah. Or he struggled against it. The important thing here, he struggled against it, so it won't nullify his actions. But the second one is the one that he goes along with it. He doesn't struggle against it. So all the actions will be performed basically for showing off. And are such null and void. It means in the second situation, it comes to him. In the second rakat, someone joined him, so that he gets the ideas of prolonging the sujood and ruku and crying the qirah, all of this. And instead of repelling it, he does it. So on that act point, then this is null and void. So for example, he lengthens the prayer with the bowing or pretends to cry. All these actions are nullified. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ gave us an example of riyah. When he mentioned that, <coughs> when he was asked about the riyah, he mentioned that a person would get up for salah and he would beautify it and adorn it. Due to what he knows with the people watching him. Due to what he knows the people observing him. So this example of the shaykh is using is one that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa also used. So in that situation, when someone got up to pray, and then he got up to pray and he beautified it because he knows there's a big jama'ah behind him, and he didn't repel it, then that's no, and void. But if he deflected and pushed it away, and struggled against it, then the his action is accepted. However, the shaykh says now, in terms of the nullification of an action, is it the entire action that's, worth, that's nullified, or is it just some of it? So coming back now to the second type category. Now that we understand that if someone didn't repel the, the riyah in this ibadah, is it all rejected or partially rejected? She says now we have two situations likewise in this. So it went from two to two to two. So in this situation, what is it intended? So first, when the last part of the action, so any type of worship, in which the last part of the action depends on the first part, that all of it is considered one action, and all this action is either valid or invalid. So there are some ibadat that are one act, from beginning to end, there's no separation. So the example is salah. It's impossible that the last part of salah is different than the first part. Salah is one ibadah. You start off with the intention of prayer until then. You start with takbir and you come up with, with tasleem. You can't do anything between that. So salah is one act. Therefore, <coughs> the entire salah is void if the riyah comes and he doesn't repel it. So we should take note of that. So if the entire salah is bawa, then if someone prays and riyah comes to him and he doesn't repel it. We're not going to say the second rakah is good and the first rakah is not. All of it is no good. Why? Because salah is one. Understand here? It's very important. We begin with takbir, we end with tasleem, it's one. So in that situation, the second situation we mentioned, in that case, the person who didn't repel, it's ba'atim. The second one, when the latter part of the worship is connected with the first, but the first part could be sound even without the last part. So there's some ibadat where they're connected, 
But one part can be independent of the other part. So an example, the shaykh says that this, will be sadaqah. For example, someone, he has a hundred riyal. And he sincerely gives 50 riyal in charity out of it. And thereafter, he gives another 50 riyal in charity out of showing off. The first part is accepted, and the second part is not. Because the second part is disconnecting the first, even though both of them are considered acts of ibadah. Means you give 50 here, the next time, like a few moments later, you get another 50. That's one ibadah, that's another one. You can separate two. All the sadaqah you gave, but this one had one intention, that one another one. So the first one will count, the second one is not counting. For these two acts of worship, why? It can be separated. So you're making it clear here? So this is an example. So when it comes to the issue of riya, we need to take a look at the type of action which you perform. And let me just mention more. What about, he says, can riya occur during wudu and ablution? Does it extend to also to nullify the salah? So Sheikh said here, the example of charity we just mentioned, doesn't, does it only affect the aspects affected or these aspects only affected? So now he gives the example. He says both are possible. It may extend to salah because the ablution is separate worship with the interdependent aspects. The cleaning of every limb is not an independent act of worship. And it may be linked with charity since it's not like the salah in every form. So he's making a comparison between the two. So for example, wudu in some aspects like salah. Because you have to wash every limb. And you started with one intention all the way to the end. As we studied long ago in Durus and Muhammad about the ibadat and the shurut of salah, we mentioned you have to have a niyyah to be connecting the whole. You can't be, you know, parts and you intend to break the wudu and then start again. You have to be connecting it. But so one angle, wudu resembles salah. A second angle resembles charity in that some of the acts of worship, like you're washing your hand, which is different than washing the face. Man, sometimes, for example, Sheikh says example, that if you're doing wudu, and you might wash one limb over another more. This one three, this one two. Or you feel like you didn't wash this one properly, so you rewash this one. He said, this happens. So the point is saying that it resembles both. It has aspects of both. But if he says here, unlike Salah, right, wudu, you can sometimes repeat things. Like if you wash your face and you feel like you didn't cover all of it, you can go back and can wash it again. Whereas in Salah, if you go and try to do a second rukur, because you feel you didn't do the first one, ba'atil. Because in Raqqa, you can't have that many, or you can't have a third Right, so we have one rukur and in each rakah, not two. Right, so his point he's trying to say is that there's some resemblance, some not. In any case, after the conclusion comes to this, is that he's trying to make the point that there is resemblance to them and each side. So obviously, it's something which he says at the end, right, that it requires some research and requires some discussion. But he concludes by saying here, right, that somebody can do some things in salah, which although you can do in salah, and some aspects of charity resemble the wudu. The point is, if an action has connection, from beginning to end, and it's one action, then Riyah will become, break all of it. And if it's an action we can separate between the two, then the action will be accepted part of it, where it says no Riyah, the other part will be falsified or nullified. And this is what the ulama they mentioned uh, outside, not just here, I mean, I want to mention just a few more points on Riyah because it's an important topic, even though Shaykh doesn't talk about it more. Because it is something which we need to have knowledge of. Because the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna akhafa ma akhafa alaykum. Al-Shaykh al-Asghar. And then when they asked him in Riz, he said, Riyah. So it's the one he feared most for us. So we need to have more knowledge of it. So something you want to mention is that, in general, right, some of the Rashaq al-Shaykh Salah al-Shaykh, they mentioned the Riyah is of two types in general. The Riyah of the Muslim and the Riyah of the Munafiq. So Riyah, when he talks about Riyah, there's different types of it. Or there's different categories of it. So one of the biggest categories is the Riyah of the Muslim versus the Riyah of the Munafiq. The Riyah of the Muslim is what we're talking about here. It's a riyah that happens in the a'mal al-sariha. Like, I, like I'm a Muslim, and then riyah might come to me in my salah, in my this act and that act. Whereas riyah al-munafiq is aslu deen It's in the very foundation of religion. So the riyah al-munafiq is that he outwardly pretends to be a Muslim. He inherently is a disbeliever. So that's the type of showing off. He's showing off to people that he's Muslim, but he's hard. Like, you know, he doesn't, they don't believe. So this is important to understand when we talk about riyah. We're talking about the riyah of the Muslim, not the riyah of the munafiq. Because Riyah Malafiq, Allah describes them having Riyah. Allah describes them having Riyah. Batal and Muriyah and Nas. Allah says they perform actions, Yura'un and Nas, the Rayyad Kurun Allah illa Qalila. That they perform the acts of Salah only for the people. To show off to the people. And they don't know Allah much. So there's a difference between the two. So we shouldn't be understanding here when we're talking about Riyah that we're talking about Riyah Malafiq. For the Riyah Malafiq is the Asr of the Deen. Very foundation. They don't even believe in Allah. Whereas we're talking about Riyah the Muslim. We're all Muslims. We submit to Allah, but the Riyadh can come to different acts of worship that occur to us. 
خلاص بينا في الشيخ صار على شيخ مثل كتاب توحيد شرح كتاب التوحيد another benefit I want to mention is the riya in regard to the ibadat we mentioned this the riya is in focus of the ibadat what about riya in the umur dunyawiya the affairs of the dunya is this such thing as riya in that and the general mashayikh said no it doesn't apply and this doesn't apply because the, when it comes to the affairs of the dunya the affairs of the dunya are not ibadat and the affairs of the dunya if you do something for the sake of the people or to protect yourself from what the people may see or hear it's not the same, it's not haram, not the same way it is for ibadah. For ibadah belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُ بِي شَيْئًا So this is something which Imam Ibn Qudama, he mentions in his kitab, Minhaj, Mukhtasim Minhaj al-Qasidim. And I'm going to read some parts of the English translation for whoever is interested in reading more about Riyah. In that which is in English, you may find it in there. In the translation of Mukhtasim Minhaj al-Qasidim, page 221, downwards. Alright, it's very important. In there, Ibn Qudami talks about a nice bahath or mabhath on the riya, and especially in English. Mukhtasar min Haj Qasidin. He says on page, here, 223 of the English translation, Still someone may wonder, is riya prohibited, detestable, or permissible? If riya is connected to the acts of worship, then it is prohibited, since the person who does it in the divine area commits a great sin. Because he is in fact seeking someone other than Allah the Almighty, who is the only one worthy of, of worship. If, however, riya is in something that is not related to worship, such as collecting wealth and seeking prominence and prestige, then it is not prohibited only if done with unlawful, only if it is done with unlawful means. So in this connection it is worth mentioning that people's intention may generally originally be directed to something good when doing some acts as, as beautifying their clothes and decorating their houses. For it is part of a man's nature to dislike that any deficiencies to be seen of him. And Muslim records from Ha'i ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu the, the Prophet said, Whoever, he who has in, heart, in his heart the weight of an Adam and pride shall not enter paradise. And a man said, O Messenger of Allah, Verily a person loves that his dress should be fine and his shoes should be fine. And the Prophet said, Verily Allah is the most beautiful and he loves beauty. Pride is to disdain or look down upon the truth and can to have contempt for the people. So the Shaykh here is proving here that when it comes to the more dunya, it's not riya. For sometimes we may do things in the dunya to seek worldly gain or wealth or prestige in order to deflect people that they may see from us something that's lowly. And he, then he actually mentions, I don't know if it's mentioned in translation, the example of Yusuf alayhi salam when he sought the position of the ministry um, from Al Aziz, mentioned that he's capable and knowledgeable. And other examples that he mentions. And likewise, our Shaykh Shaykh Abdul Aziz al-Rajaheen, Hafizullah Ta'ala, was asked the same question. Is Riyya entered into worldly affairs? And is it is someone held accountable for that? And Shaykh al-Rajaheen, Hafizullah, said the affairs or actions of the worldly life, it is not said that Riyya enters into the worldly life. Uh, it only enters into acts of worship. So the worldly life is permissible. From food, drink, sleep, housing, um, etc. However, it can only be said, it's only discussed if something like this occurs by way of boasting or extravagance. Then this is something, right? Then this is something that enters. Uh, the, sorry, it says this is something else. However, in regards to Riyah, then it's only in the acts of worship. Right, so we take from that, as some of us were discussing last week, when it comes to the Umur Dunya, then there's no Riyah in that. In that it's not a prohibited, it's not prohibited. In that if someone does something in order to deflect or to be seen from people something, again, without boasting, without pride, without extravagance. Yeah, someone who intends something so people may think, for example, of him that he's a lowly person. And so he wants to wear some type of clothing or some gain some type of prestige in society because this is not the riyad and the ibadah. It's not the riyad that we're talking about. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this discussion we're having is riyad, is ibadah. So it's very important to mention that. And of course, we're not talking about boasting, we're not talking about we have this uh, extravagance, we to sleep full in Allah, like him, Muslim. So we shouldn't be extravagant, Allah does not do extravagant. Nor should we be boasting, because we know this is the way of the people who Allah displays, who collect wealth, right? and have them to cast in order to boast to people, or to be amassing wealth, or this dunya is la'ibun wa lahum, wa takathurun, right? and to all of these affairs Allah mentions. So that's a benefit. If you want more, you refer to the kitab, Mukhtasim min Haj al-Qasidi, this case English translation, page 2023, 2024. And the fatah of Sheikh Rajahi, he's taken from, from his, uh, the work, fatah uh, Munawwi'ah, number 13. Right, the various and miscellaneous fatah, uh, 
uh, tape number or uh, 13. Another benefit is it can sit in Riyadh if someone leaves off an action for the sake of the people. Something people ask this question. Riyadh, we know if we do something for the sake of the people, it's considered Riyadh. I leave off an action that's supposed to be for Allah for the sake, due to the sake of the people. Is that Riyadh? And the answer is yes, and it can also need tafsil. For there's a statement of Fudil bin Riyadh, the ulama, they often mention, uh, where he says, Rahimullah, Tarakul Aman, Mi Ajirin Nas, Riyadh. That leaving off an action due to the people is Riyadh. And Wa'amul, Min Ajirin Nas, Shirkun. And then to act for the sake of the people is shirk. So he said, Tarakul Aman, Mi Ajirin Nas, Riyadh. والعمل من أجل الناس شرك والإخلاص أن يعافك أن يعافيك الله فيهما ومنهما. So the true إخلاص من الله سيدي in both of them. So this narration was often mentioned, like Sheikh Rasulullah Taymiyyah, he mentions it in others, although I didn't find for it an origin in terms of its actual original source and its authenticity, والله أعلم. But the legend day, man, the primary committee was asked about this particular saying. What is intended by? Is it 100% correct? So they were asked, the Bermuda community, if Allah ibn Iyad, he said, refraining from good, doing good deeds because of people's riyah, and doing good deeds due to them is shirk. So many of the Muslim brothers and I sometimes feel obliged to refrain from some suppository acts of ibadah, fearing fitna or of, of ourselves or being beaten or being assaulted, or that Muslim brothers in general will be subjected to fitna by the government, tightening its grip around them. By Allah, I ask you, have, have we, as a consequence, fallen to Riyah? And if this is the case, what is the way out? So the primary committee answered, saying the second part of the statement of Fulayl, namely that doing a deed because of people is shirk, then this is absolutely true. This is what we're benefiting, to do something solely for the people, that's a type of Riyah, which is shirk. And Agana shirk, I shirk. You got up or pray or to give something solely for the people, that's shirk. So this is right, absolutely true. To do something for only for the people solely, it's shirk. وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ We're supposed to only worship Allah. But they, then they say, as, as the evidence of Quran and Sunnah, show the obligation of sincerity in worship. And that should be, it should be done for Allah alone. And the prohibition of riyah is called shirk al-azghar. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He declared as being the thing he fears most for the ummah. As for the for first part of the statement, whoever these up in action, or refrains from action for the sake of the people, then the alayhi wa sallam says, this is not absolutely true. It means it needs some elaboration, as it depends on the intention. The Prophet said, all actions are, by, are but by intention. And every man shall have that which he intended. Special care should be taken over making sure deeds are in conformity to the Sharia. As the Prophet said, anyone who does something that we have not ordered in worship, we reject it. Therefore, if it happens that due to a person's situation, that they refrain from certain deeds which are not obligatory for them, through fear of contingent harm, then this will not be considered riyah. Instead, it belongs to the siyas sharia the Sharia-oriented politics. And it's sitting in place to the refraining from performing sun nawafir, acts of ibadah in front of people, fearing to be praised in a manner that they may lead them to harm or fitna. However, the obligatory acts of ibadah cannot be forsaken, except for a valid shari reason. So that's the fact that we take. So it needs tafsir this statement. So if someone's leaving off, the conclusion is something that's obligatory, for the sake of the people, then of course this will be considered prohibited. And if it's someone's leaving off a nawafir action, Due to right, fear, or in this case, to be praised in front of the people, or to be trialed, and that is not considered riyah. Right? But if it's left off for other than that, then it can be. So the person has to verify and assess the situation that they're in. And so we generally see that we should try our best to do good deeds. And the best way, because someone might be asking, how can we avoid this riyah in general then? And the best solution to avoid riyah is to do your good deeds in hidden, in secrecy. It's one of the best solutions to fight against riyah. Of course, that which has to be done apparently, you do apparently, right? You can't pray secret salat al jama'ah, it's not happening. Right? You have to pray in the jama'ah with the jama'ah, you can't pray secretly. Out of fear riyah, that's not that, that's not what's intended. But for the nawaf and the sunan, we know Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi used to pray in his house. And the hikmah, that some ahadi authenticate that it's actually more rewarding to pray the sunan in your house. So I mentioned 25 times more than if someone prayed in the open. So that's why you find in the benefit there if someone can pray the sunan at home. As Ibn Umar mentioned, kind of study raka'atin fi bayti'i. He used to pray two raka'at at home. And many of the different salawat, and this is better. Wa ahsan. And this is closer to taqwa, and closer to fighting against riyah. And that's how the salaf used to understand the issue. To fight against riyah, do things in secrecy. And of course, that we have to always check our intention. If you care for a bit. And as a benefit, the best way, what you have to always remember, all ibadat can be 
It should be done for Allah. So we always have to remind ourselves. As a fact, Shaykh Hussain ibn Taymiyyah said, as Ibn Qayyim said from him, that he said, Yaka na'budu tadfa'u al-riya wa yaka nista'een tadfa'u al-kibriya. As Shaykh Hussain ibn Taymiyyah ibn Qayyim says, our Shaykh Shaykh Hussain ibn Taymiyyah said, that Yaka na'budu, the ayah of Surah Fatiha, only you Allah we worship, this statement reflects riya. Yaka na'budu, only for Allah we worship. So by this statement, we're affirming that we're not doing things for other than Allah. And kana yiraju liqa Allah, we're not doing for anyone else. And last thing, with can astain, tajfa'ur kibriya, takes away arrogance. That only you, Allah, we seek aid. It means when us, we don't believe we're self-sufficient. We don't believe we're independent. We need Allah. So that's a fa'idah. We have to remind ourselves that if we have to always remember, even the Fatiha alone, or if we're praying salah and we read the Fatiha, the Fatiha should remind us, not the riyah. means even a hundred thousand people stand behind you, yaqan abudu, yaqan astain, you say. Sit and say, subhanAllah, I hear footsteps behind me. This is what you're saying. Very important to remind ourselves. And of course, as someone they train themselves upon that. And this fact that was mentioned by Imam Ibn Qayyim and Madad Salaki, volume 1, page 79. And of course, there are more that can be said on Riyah, but just as there are some side benefits, because the topic is important, and I encourage the brothers to read from those works. Our son Shaykh Salim, Hafizullah, he has a kitab of Riyah about Riyah, its types, its categories. And if you go, um, and that book is in Arabic, the Kitab of Sheikh Sadeem, but in terms of English, what I find, this is this Kitab, translated in Mukhtasim Mihaj Qasidin, of Sheikh uh, Imam Ibn Qudam, Rahimahullah, and he goes into categories and the types, and it's a good read from page 20 to 23 downwards, and I recommend that we read about it, so we can protect our goodies. We, wanna, we don't want our, our goodies to be spoiled. Now, continuing, Sheikh Rahim, then moves into what Sheikh Islam said. Because now that's the first part of the chapter. The second chapter was part of it is the Hayyita ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Whoever dies while calling on to other than Allah in equality or along with him as a partner will enter the hellfire hadith reported by Bukhari. So here, Shaykh Rathimi is talking about the Hayyita man mata. Whoever dies, and he calls upon with alongside Allah a partner, then the Khalana will enter the hellfire. So Shaykh Rathimi says the word man, whoever is a product of condition, serving for generality for both males and females. And we know the wording man, it gives us the indication also of generality. Right? This is something that we mentioned before. So here it's giving us generality and also a product of condition. So he's saying while calling on Ponta other, other than Allah, means taking him and making another person, joining them as partners with Allah and equal, either by supplicating to it by way of worship or requesting or supplicating on all of this. And this divides into two types. For ibad is a supplication. Dua is of two types. Before we get there, so what he's saying, جَعْلُ nidden. So nidden means an equal, a partner. By making for Allah a mathir, a nadir, a comparative, an equal. And Allah doesn't have that. تَجَعْلُ لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Allah says, don't make for Allah partners and you will know. So we know from this, that this is a person who does this, i.e. dies upon this, mamata, and is supplicating to other Allah as a partner, دَخَلَ nar. So why is this person into that fire? Because in one day we equated someone else with Allah. It's a shirk. Allah says, do not associate partners with Allah and you know. Well, you know. And Allah Shaykh Sun tells us about dua. What is dua? It means it's categories. So we should write it down. Dua is of two types. Dua al-ibadah or dua al-mas'ala. When we talk about dua, this is dua is of two types. Dua al-ibadah and dua al-mas'ala. So dua of worship, such as fasting, the salah, other types of worship, these are called dua of Ibad, the supplication of worship. When a person observes salah or fast, he has called upon his Lord in the circumstance to forgive him, save him from punishment, grant him his requests. This is during the salah. It also entails clear cut supplications. So, dua al ibadah is those type of acts of worship in which the, by them you're seeking Allah's forgiveness. You're seeking Allah's protection from that fire. And in them, you make clear dua too. So in this situation, this is called dua al ibad for they are obligated upon us or they are legislated. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ اُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي Masha'Allah, so the Lord says, call upon me and I will answer and respond to you. Very those who arrogate from my worship, you will put them in the fire, humiliated, disgraced. So from that ayah we benefit that Allah made supplication, act of ibad. And that's also proof when we talk about dua the ibadah. Allah says, "Yes, takbiruna an ibadati." So you call dua ibadah, dua ibadah. So dua ibadah literally making dua 
or the actions where you are doing acts like salah and fasting with your by these you're seeking forgiveness by this you're seeking to be protected from the hellfire and they even include dua at times like in salah many right many dua would do in salah in sujood of aktiru or sometimes if aktiru fihi dua right make lots of dua in it now the second i said the division here is whoever directs any type of worship to other than Allah has a positive from the fold of Islam. If he bows to a person or prostrates for a thing, revering it, the way he reveres Allah or views Allah, then the bowing prostration, if this kind of person, is a type of polytheism, shirk. It is for this reason the Prophet ﷺ forbade stooping, by means lowering oneself or greeting one another. When he was asked concerning the one he meets his brother, should he stoop, means should he bend himself for him? He said no. This is the hadith, the Shaykh's quoting the hadith of Ahmed. And Abu Dawud, Anas and Tirmidhi imagine others. When he, the man asked the Prophet when we meet with each other, should we hug? He said no. He said, should we bow ourselves when meeting? He said no. He said, should we shake hands? He said yes. So then the Prophet is not allowed to bend. Right? Rakur is only for Allah. Right? We bow down for Allah. So here we benefit that. If anyone did any type of ibad, let's just say for Allah, it's considered shirk. So the first type is dua al-ibadah. Those type of actions, like fasting, the salah, and other forms of worship, when a person does it, he's hoping for forgiveness, protection of worship. It also includes actual making dua in them, right? In those actions, you're making dua. The second type is called dua al-mas'ala. Before we get to shaykh, some ignorant people do this. When they greet you, they lower themselves. So it's pertinent. The must believer does disapproves it. So the person is re- 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 revering you to the expense of his own religion. Means if someone meets you and they're bowing down, they're bending over. Or some people, they may bend your head to them. Or these things like in karate or smart shots, they do that. The, the Mashaikh says, not allowed. For Ruku is ibad. And Rasulullah says, prohibited. It's not a type of greeting. So in some cultures, they do that. They bow to people they meet. Not allowed in Islam. Right? We shake hands. Musafaha is ibad. And it's sunnah. So Shaykh mentioned him, we should remind people who do that. So they might not even realize they're doing it. And he said, because they're doing that at the expense of their religion. And they may, they're trying to respect you, maybe. At what expense? Their religion, which is not good. Second dua of request. Dua of mas'ala, dua of request. It does not all entail shirk. All right? It has aspects. So if the creature has the ability to grant the person a request, then it's not shirk. So dua of mas'ala, supplication request, it can entail when you go to somebody and you ask them for help. And that which they keep of doing. So dua al-masali, we're requesting some help from somebody, supplicating or literally requesting for them to help you and aid you. Then the shaykh says, the creature, the creation has the help, ability to help you. Like if someone says, you said to them, give me some water, and the person can do that, then it's fine. So whoever requests of you to grant him, and Rasulullah Sallallahu said, whoever requests of you to grant him something, then he should require grant him. It means if someone asks you for help, you aid them. And Allah says, in the with the hadr al-qismat ul al-qurba, wal yatama wal masakeen, if arzuquuhu minhu, وَقُولُ لَهُمْ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا And should the relatives or orphans in need be present by doing distribution of the inheritance to the heirs, they provide them with some portion of evidence and see them in good words. So when a poor person stretches the hand to you and says, give me something, it is not sure that, you, that they say this. Allah says, they provide them with something. فَرَزُقُوهُمْ Allah says. Does it mean here that they're رَزَاقْ رَازِقِينَ? No. When Mishaf says, فَرَزُقُوهُمْ means give them. From that which Allah gave them. Right. It's very important, right? The Mishaf explains, فَرَزُقُوهُمْ means Give them. For risk can mean ata, gift. It means what it means. You're giving something to the dunya. So give them, Allah says, from that which Allah gave us. That's all it reminds us. Mimma razzaqakumullah. That which Allah blessed us with. Allah wa razzaq. And then he said, but when he requests the creature, what Allah Allah can do? In this supplication act of Ibadah. If someone comes to say, grant me children, grant me right, uh, success in the akhirah, or give me rain, not allowed. And the Shaykh says here that the meaning of the Messenger of Allah says, whoever dies while calling upon other than Allah as a partner, is an equal in worship, as an equal in the request, and it entails the aforementioned explanation. Unfortunately, some Islamic lands, lands, some believe that the particular person buried in the grave who remains may still be in the ground, or might have been eaten up by the earth, could benefit or cause harm. Means you will go to those who have passed away in the dead, and they ask them, thinking that this person, who probably has become decomposed, can aid you. And Sheikh said, or such dead person can provide you progeny, who those who are barren. And this, the refuge of Allah Assad, is made to shirk which throws the person out of the fold of Islam. To affirm this is worship is worse. To affirm this is worse than affirming alcohol consumption, illicit intercourse, and homosexuality, because this act here is a type of disbelief, and not just an act of wickedness. It's very important the difference between a major sin 
and an issue of kufr and shirk. Right? Kufr and shirk is the top of the list, the worst of what you could do. So we benefit from this that the people who are doing dua and mas'ala, that the person we're asking to aid us, they're requesting, it's not all shirk. It means the person is capable, that you can ask them. And when we study the kitab of Sal'ani, Tatheer al Atiqar, we learn the condition that we can make istighath with the khalq. One, we can seek request and help from the creation. And we mentioned that Rabbi Shaykh said, then there are three things someone has to have. One is a hayyun, they have to be alive. How they're present and how they're capable. So these three, then you can ask someone, can you help me in my homework? Not, nothing wrong, nothing wrong that he knows how to help you in it. And he's present with you. And the person love you ask him. But for that which only Allah can do, you have to ask Allah. Allah says, the misguided the one who doesn't ask him. And this situation, in fact, is the type of shit. When you ask someone for something, all Allah can give. Like you say, so and so forgive me. Well, I have to do Allah. Only Allah forgives sins. Or you ask someone, guide me children. Or give me Jannah. This is not allowed. So dua mas'ala and dua al-ibadah. The point is, Shaykh is talking about both of them. The point is, whoever calls upon Allah and makes a partner with him and gives them dua, means either dua al-ibadah or dua mas'ala, and that which only Allah can help you with, then dakhal al-nar. So now Shaykh gets into this last part. Dakhal al-nar means forever. Even though the expression has not pointed to that. So this is because dakhala declares an action which is not limited. Similarly, Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ جَنَّ مَمَوَاهُمُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنَ الْصَارِ That whoever sets up parties with me, then Allah has forbidden paradise for them. And the fire will be an abode for the zalimeen, they will not help us for them. Surah Ma'idah, Ayah 72. So, such, so if such a forbidden entrance to paradise, then it implies that they will be in hellfire forever. So when it means يَدَّخَلَ النَّارِ means خَالِدٍ فِيهَا And we know the different ayat indicate that. إِنَّ لَذِنَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ الْمُشْرِكِينَ فِي نَارِ الْجَهَنَّمَ خَارِدِينَ فِيهَا Forever they abide therein. So he says that here what is intended is that the obligatory to fear shirk counts to consider the kind of punishment. And the polytheists will lose in the hereafter because he will be in hellfire forever. He will also lose this worldly life because he will not have benefited anything from it. And the evidence has been established against him, the warner has come to him, but he lost. And the refuge in Allah is sought. He did not gain anything from this world. Allah says, أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرَ وَجَاءَكُمْ النَّذِيرُ He will not give you life long enough to give a chance to him who was willing to open his heart and ears and to lift to Allah his inward sight. You received the messengers. Means, Surah Fatiha, Ayah 37, means Allah is giving us a long, life, long enough lifespan that we can be reminded and that we can be guided. Why is it in the Quran, it's how Allah says, ذِكْرٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُمْ قَلْبٌ The Quran is the guidance for the one who has a heart. Meaning the one who has faham, understanding, to comprehend the Qur'an means to be guided. And Allah says in the Qur'an, وَمِنَ اللَّهِ سَمِعْ عُبِدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفٍ فَإِنْ أَصَابُهُ خَيْنُ تُمَأَنَّ بِهِ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتُهُ فِدْنَةٌ مِنْ قَلَبَ عَلَىٰ وَجِهِ خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ وَبِيْنِ يَدْعُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَدُرُّهُ وَمَا لَا يَنْفَعُهُ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الضَّلَالُ الْبَعِيدِ يَدْعُو لِمَنْ ضَرُّهُ أَقْرَبُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِ لَبِئْسِ الْمَوْلَى وَلَبِئْسِ الْعَصِيرِ And among mankind is he who worships Allah as if he were upon the very edge, i.e. doubt. If good befalls him, he is content. But if a child befalls him, he turns back on his heels. He loses both this world life and the hereafter. This is evidence, evident loss. He calls upon, uh, besides Allah, uh, onto that which hurts him not, nor profits him. That is the straying far away. He calls onto him who is harm, whose harm is nearer to him than profit, uh, means benefit. Certainly that is an evil mawla, and certainly an evil friend. Surah Hajj, Ayah 11 to 13. So we benefit from here, Khasir al-Dunya wa l-Akhirah. Who is that? Yad'oona min dunillah. The one who calls Ma'adhan Allah. Fear them dunya and akhirah. Because the true failure is in the hereafter. But the failure is also that what he did in dunya, he didn't avail him either. But we know the dunya, what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a means to success. Wa ma tawfiqi illa billah. Shu'ayb said, my success only with Allah. In the dunya, we have to have ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the akhirah, the one who feels the one who doesn't see himself in a fire. قُلْ إِنَّ الْخَاسِرِينَ الَّذِينَ خَصِرُوا وَأَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَهْلِيهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَ عَلَى ذَلِكَ وَالْخُسْرَانَ الْمُبِينَ Allah says, fails. It's the one who fails himself and his family يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَ That is a true failure. It's very important when we talk about success and failure. Failure and success in the Mizan al-Sara'ah. Not in the Mizan al-Dunya. We have failure and success in dunya, yes, but the real one, this is what our minds is of. وَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَلِ النَّارِ وَدُخِلِ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدَ فَازِ وَمَنْ يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدَ فَازِ فَوْزٍ عَظِيمًا We have to remind ourselves of that. Whoever obeys Allah's Messenger, that person is truly successful. Whoever is saved from the hellfire into Jannah, then they are successful. Now that sometimes we come today, people 
forgetting that the true success where it lies. And the Shaykh said, Allah said, فَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ فَعْبُدُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ مِن دُونِهِ قُلْ إِنَّ الْخَاسِرِينَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسِهِمْ مَا أَهْلِيهِمْ نَا أَنفُسِهُمْ أَهْلِيهِمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامِ Allah says that the losers are those who lose themselves and families in the judgment. Very, those that manifest lost. Surah Zulman, Ayah 15. Thus, he lost his soul since he did not gain anything. He lost his family because if they were from the believers, they'll be in paradise. So he will not enjoy them in the hereafter, and if they enter the hell, then it is the same. Because whenever, whenever any group enters, it, it curses the other. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Every time when Ummah enters one, la'anat ukhtaha, they curse the other one after it. And they're cursing one other in Jahannam. And we know in the Quran, Ali Fir'aun, the followers of Fir'aun, Ali Fir'aun, they be the du'afa and the aqya, they argue in Jahannam. You misled us, you misled us, Quran kullun fiha. All of us, Quran kullun, all of us in Hafar. We're all in Hafar. It doesn't matter who blamed who. And this is important to mention here the benefit of that, Shaykh is pressing on that the success comes from that, Tawheed and then Deen. So Shaykh says, Shaykh is very sneaky, man, he's very concealed. He may be in a person while well, he doesn't even know it, except after su- 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 sufficient contemplation. So that's one of the Salaf, pious predecessors said, I have not, not struggled against anything in my soul as I did regarding sincerity. And we mentioned, this is the statement of Sufyan al Thawri, as the footnotes also mentioned in Jamal al Hikam, and he said the statement originally in Hidya Abu Naim. Right, that he mentioned authentically, to. I never struggled on a shay. I shed aliyya on min nafsi. I never struggled against something more severe upon me in my soul. Marratin li or marratin alik. Sometimes I overcome it, sometimes it overcomes me. And it's the intentions, we have to make it sincerely for Allah. So we see now the importance, right? So shirk is very hard to deal with, it's not easy. But Allah makes sincerity easy for the servant when he pays serious attention to seeking Allah's face with his actions, not seeking people's praise, avoiding their disparagement. The people will never benefit him even if they come out with him to follow his corpse. They will not benefit from him except his deeds. Then he quotes the hadith that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, two things follow, the one who dies. Two of them return, and one remains. His wealth, family, and deeds follow him, his family wealth return, and his deeds remain. Hadith Anas, Bukhari, Muslim. It's a benefit, right? Two of them, they come back, only one that remains. So likewise, it is necessary that the one who it is not delighted, the one that is not delighted, that the people accept his statements just because they are his. He should rather be happy that his statements are accepted when it seems to be truth. Not necessarily because they are his. Similarly, it should not be saddened or saddened him that people reject his statements because it is the truth. In this matter, sincerity becomes truth, I think. It's actually difficult. A difficult thing except for the one who is truly and submissively devoted to Allah. Upon the straight path, Allah will accept, will help him achieve it and make it easy for him. A great value there. That we should not be happy if people accept our statements unless it's upon truth. We should not be sad and people reject their statements if we know it's true. It's very important. Right? The people, they're not, right, they are scale of right and wrong. And we should also remember that pleasing the people will make us captives to them. And when we please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hey, Aisha teaches us, whoever does acts in order to obtain Allah's pleasure, right? Allah will please with him. And the people will become pleased with him. When we seek people's pleasure, then Allah will become displeased with us. And so too the people will be pleased with us. Then he finishes the chapter with the statement of the hadith of Muslim, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, where he said, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever meets Allah, not join any partner with him, you will enter paradise. And whoever meets him, or join a partner, any partner with him, you will enter how far. So here now he says, the word man again, the same as we mentioned before. The word man is a particle of condition serving generality, and his company, the word laqiyah, when man laqiyah Allah, whoever meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he meets Allah that he is not committing shit. La yashu kubi shayan. Dakhar al-Jannah. That he enters paradise. Dakhar al-Jannah here means we enter paradise. So the mission here, that he enters paradise. Uh, so he said, does not negate that he has been punished according to his sins. If he has sins as appointed by the text of Sfat. Then this word, Dakhar al-Jannah, doesn't intend that he may not be punished beforehand due to some sins, due to some falling into some prohibitions and some threats. So we know there, there are texts in the Qur'an of Wa'id, in the Qur'an Sunnah of, of threatening, and if Allah wills, He may punish someone for it. But, it, it means that the person falls under the will of Allah. Now we mentioned it before, ma dunadari But as that's the shit, Allah forgives for whomever He wills. 
Allah punishes whoever He wills, and He He punishes or He uh, forgives whoever whomever He wills. So here he says to Sheikh that he's under Allah's will, Taht Mashiatullah, and he's saying that La Yushrik serves as as accusative mode, means form, showing the condition of subject of the Qiyah. So here Shay'an is indefinite now in the context of, right? Uh, the conditional phrase here indicating all forms of shirk. So he joins it with even the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then who entered how far? Right, as we know, we're in the Rabi' al Awwal. And there are some people who will celebrate the birthday of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they may well be his status above the status Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to him. And they may say things about him that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did Allah. So even someone commits shirk with him regarding him, then this person will also be under the threat of going to Hafar. لا تطروني فابا said do not be extreme in regards to me كما أطرت النصارى عيسى بن مريم as the Nasara were extreme regarding Isa بن مريم so even if it's a Rasul صلى الله عليه or an idol or a rock or a wathan or a salam or all of these things that we spoke about all of that is the same shayan includes everything so what about the one who in regards to the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم what a great calamity Sheikh says means if someone right, what about the one who regards the Messenger as greater than Allah and he turns to him in times of calamities he would then he would not turn to Allah. In fact, he may even turn towards something lower than the Messenger So there are those who care not about swearing. But Allah, whether upon the truth or lie, as such is the difference between concerning the one who bothers not uh, who bothers not about swearing by Allah, but would only swear without his creed or something he refers upon the truth. Should he, should he be requested to swear by Allah or by things less than this? It is said that he should be made to swear by Allah even if he lies. In that, since he should not be assisted upon shirk, this is the correct opinion. So, Sheikh mentioned here an example um, that there's a difference concerning the one who bothers, right? Who's going to swear by uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, other than Allah, and he doesn't believe right, that person he's swearing upon is the love of Allah. Should he be swearing upon other than Allah? It means because he might not be truthful. He said never. The situation should be even if he's lying. And swearing by Allah, it's better than doing that shirk. It means we're not supposed to swear by Allah. Of course, we're not also supposed to lie by swearing by Allah. But the point is, this will shirk the more correct opinion. We're swearing to only for Allah. Man yahlif, whoever is going to swear, for yahlif billah. Let him swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is also said that he should be made to swear by other than Allah. Since the aim is to get uh, for him to reveal the truth, which will never be achieved since he would only lie. He would lie on, he would lie on oath. We have, we have a say, Sheikh says, but if he is being truthful, he will swear and fall into shirk. Means that this situation, we should always be swearing for Allah. We're not supposed to ever encourage someone not to. Then Sheikh says, is entering the hell for the one who commits shirk necessary, necessitate that he be there forever. And this will depend on the category of shirk. If it's minor shirk, then this does not necessitate that he be in hellfire forever. But if it's major shirk, then he will definitely abide in hellfire forever, as the text indicate. And we said it last week as well. We talked about the khilaf, is shirk asghar, forgiven or not forgiven. And we said, Wallahu a'lam, that this is a khilaf in ulama. And a group of them said that yes, he will be forgiven. It's, it's considered a major sin, and tahtim al Allah. Another group of ulama said that no, he will not be forgiven. And this person will be punished for that. And he, he will then go into paradise. But we say, Wallahu a'lam, which seems to be, right, the more correct opinion is that, uh, that inshallah, the person who commits minor shirk, that he's underneath the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know it's a khilaf, but many of the did this, they make this tarjih, this kind of uh, correct opinion. But the shaykhs are talking that they all agree that if someone does commit minor shirk, they're not going to have fire forever. That much we agree. Whereas the major shirk is the opposite. The person who enters it, have fire, have fire, will have fire forever. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have to in Allah, la ya fura shirkabi. He does not forgive the shirk, be associated, uh, partners be associated with him. However, the shaykhs said the condition or discussion of a major or minor shirk, or major shirk is in two cases. Whoever meets Allah not joining any partners with him will not enter paradise. And the other saying, whoever meets Allah or joining partners with him will enter the hellfire. So whoever meets Allah not committing major shirk will enter paradise even if he's punished in hell as appropriated or appropriate. And his eventual place in the boat will be in the paradise. And that whoever meets him will meet upon major shirk. They will enter the hellfire forever. And this is, does not need elaboration. So the first one is, if it's a Muslim who dies upon major shirk, I saw a person who dies from major shirk, and this person will be in half five forever. As to someone who meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he used to worship Allah only, but he committed sins, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished him, but he will go to half five. And this is what the Messenger said, 
Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhara jannah wa inna sabahu qabla dhalika ma asabahu. Now whoever says there's no deity worthy, worthy of worship except for Allah will enter paradise even if he had to be punished. Even if he's to be punished before that, for what he is punished for. Means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish whoever he wills, but will enter paradise and there are many, many proofs of that. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhara jannah. Al-Hajj al-Shafa'a. Now let me not deal with proof this. So we conclude from that, the major shirk is the one who puts in hellfire forever. As for riyah, minor shirk, then the person who commits it will not be in hellfire forever, but no, nonetheless, it's dangerous, and so we should be feared. Then Shaykh Hussain finishes the chapter and talks about the different masayah we benefit from this chapter. For example, we learned about the fear of shirk. Second benefit, we learned that <coughs> riyah, showing up as a form of shirk. We learned that there is such thing as, as minor shirk. And in other hadith, Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, major, minor. Someone just say, what's the proof? Here's the proof. The Prophet said major and minor. And we also mentioned in some other lessons that some other said there are three categories of shirk. Uh, major, minor, hidden. In other words, say major, minor. And the hidden is part of minor. And the Ulama mentioned of Shaykh Allah it doesn't matter how you divide it, all of them are agreed. So major is major. And they say minor and major, minor and secret, means hidden or one. Some of the separators is calling it because some of the comes to shirk al asghar and some of the shirk al khafi. But then the extreme say that. But the point is, we learned that there is such a thing. There is such a thing. And then it said for benefit that it, it is what is most fear for the righteous person. The fifth benefit that we learned that how close paradise and hellfire is to a person. Sixth, connecting between the proximities of one hadith. Means whoever meets Allah, not join any part with him. And the seventh, that whoever meets him, join any part with him, went to hell even if he is among the most worshipful of the people. The eighth benefit the great issue of Khalil, supplication, alayhi salam, Ibrahim. When he said, وَجُنُوبَنِي وَبَنِيَا نَعْبُدُ الْأَسْنَامِ He's asking Allah to protect him and his family from what Idols, means, or him his progeny, which is a great affair. Means we learn now that we need to seek, she has said that we seek, the great, we find a great issue of Ibrahim's dua for him and his children to be protected in Al-Fahr. Idol worship. Ninth, considering it means the condition with the greater multitude. O oh Allah, my Creator, surely they have strayed the minds of many among people. So now, Shaykh said, we benefit from this, Shaykh Hussalam, that considering it, that shirk is like, as the condition with the greater multitude have been misled by it. Because Ibrahim says, O oh Allah, my Creator, surely they have, been, they have strayed the minds of many people. The tenth benefit, it contains the explanation of La ilaha illallah, as you find in Hadith Bukhari. And the last benefit in this chapter, the excellence of the one who is free of shirk. We'll just comment on the one of them, which is the tenth one. Uh, we'll comment in the ninth one. The Shaykh says here that Shaykh Rathimi says that in regards to the ninth one, Ibrahim said, Rabbi inna hunna adlalna kathira min anas. O my Lord Allah, O Allah my Creator, surely they have strayed the minds of many. In Surah Ibrahim, Ayah 36. So there's an ambiguity because the author said with the majority, while well, the verse reads many among the people. And the difference between major and many, many and majority is, is a big difference. But Allah says in the Quran concerning the, the descendants of Adam, فَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقَنَا تَبْضِيلًا And we placed in them a class distinctly above many. So he didn't say about most of the creation. So the Shaykh is a big distinguishment here. What's intended here is that many people have been misled by Shaykh. Many people have been misled and punished due to shirk. So we see here now the importance is also that we have to be with us, we have to be reminded of that. Many people fell into shirk, many people were misguided. And in Surah Rum, Allah says, Kursiru fil Abd, travel on the earth and take a look at that which is past. Those who pass before you, most of them are Mushrikun, most of them are polytheists. Very important, most of them are polytheists. And Allah says also in Surah Saba, Allah says, Allah says, Allah says, and really, Iblis was correct in his opinion. Because many people follow him. Many people they follow him, except for a very few. So here we see that in these verses, we also learn that many people were misled. So the dua of Ibrahim, in relation to this, is of great importance. For Ibrahim, despite being the Imam of Tawheed, he's still making his dua, reminding us that many were misled. Many. Inshallah, we'll end with that. If anyone has any questions or anything they'd like to ask, inshallah. Yes. You said that Salah is one after worship, right? Those type of actions which are nullified, someone has to make it up. So if someone commits riya and actions like this, they're nullified, then the person has to repeat them. If Allah doesn't accept. Right. So Allah doesn't accept these type of actions. So it's very important that we pay attention to that. But we said in the hadith, Raktuhu shirka. 
Allah will leave him and his shirk. So the action doesn't count. And so when the action doesn't count, you have to make sure it counts. You have to do it. So we have to be wary of that. And of course, when someone, even situation which Shaykh mentioned, which is Uriya occurred, and they didn't affect it, and they carried on with it, and then of course they are known and aware of this. Not in that they have doubt and we were fighting ourselves and in the sin. This is different than the one. For that one is Salah counts. Right? So we have to be certain as well that I continue my ibad and upon Uriya knowingly, that in the person then we, that wouldn't count. Allah uh, Regarding the hadith that you mentioned, uh, So, is, is the action of rejecting truth in and of itself arrogance? Or if someone does it um, because that, he feels like he's above it? Or is that in and of itself arrogance? In and of itself. For someone to reject truth is arrogance. When, when truth comes, what is after is nothing but falsehood. It can only be false without the truth. When the truth comes, to reject it means to be arrogant and to look down upon it and not to accept it, even though it's proven to be truth, it's arrogance. It's active act of arrogance. And so you find that people like this who are to keep being arrogant, it's because they don't follow the truth. And when the truth is mentioned, then they reject it. And of course, someone who does that might not be arrogant in every aspect. They might be pride, they might, might not be prideful in everything. But that is pride, or that's considered arrogance, so the Prophet defined it, and the person for Hongzha has fallen into arrogance or pride in that action. Means if someone something when you mentioned them and the truth was mentioned and they rejected it, knowing that it is true to clear to them and still say I don't have to or I'm not from it, then this is an act of kibbutz. And that's why we see that uh, the Mashaikh mentioned we look at the people who are arrogant. Kibbutz is because of this. This is what we're talking to find as kibbutz. or batar haq wa ghamt nas. Then being have a contempt on people means think you're better than them. And we know the hadith of Huraira a Muslim that's sufficient or sin of a Muslim. That he has these feelings, right, against his brother, that he holds him in contempt. Right? Muslim, he looks down upon them and has the feeling that he's better than them. Uh, on some grounds, they're not from based on the Sharia. We know the only thing that differentiates us in the Akram of Allah Taqab. So that's act of kibar, and that's considered kibar. Right? And of course, there are other types of right actions where it can be considered or can lead to kibar, right? So this is important, but, but this is part of the definition of kibar, yeah. So as soon as the hujj is established upon it, exactly, it should be showed. Yeah. This person has been showed the truth and they clarify it and then they reject it. And it's considered exactly. kibar. Okay. Okay. What, can, what led to them in the separate death, right? Okay. That and okay. it's very important that when truth is accepted, we should always try our best to accept it. And if it's not clear to us, then we will try to investigate. Well, sometimes it's not clear to people. We don't want to see what this person is arrogant. When I told them this and that, but because maybe it wasn't clear to them, so we must make sure that they understood. But the point is, this action should not be the way the Muslim. We take the haq when it comes, we have to accept it. That's the adab uh, of the people of Sunnah, right? Allah Alam. Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of for wudu as well, how you said the Shaykh said that some, in some aspects it's like the salah, some aspects it's like zakah. Mm. So, uh, if, if, if your wudu is nullified by the yet, does it in turn automatically nullify your salah because it's a prerequisite? Well, that's what he was mentioning there. Like in that angle, it, it has a connection. So, if we turn back to what he was saying there. So you say, what if Riyah comes in during the ablution? Does it extend to also nullify the Salah? Okay. He said both are possible. It may extend to Salah because ablution is separate worship uh, with the interdependent aspects and the cleaning of every limb is not an independent act of worship. And it may be linked with charity, then he continues, unlike Salah. So again, here he's like, it's possible, right? It can be said this. He says it will not affect it. He says here, um, he talks about how to make the wudu. He says here, if you repeat any part of Salah, he talks about Salah here. Uh, where is it? The Sheikh said the end requires more research. That's what he says as a conclusion. Oh, okay. so he says, I, I will not sleep until I find more research. He said, until going to his more Allah. Right? Because obviously, right, it's a condition of Salah. You know? I salat. When someone's salah and wudu is not five by riyah, he knows that, then he puts salah and what is from that. But again, this is the part we said, well, I don't, for even the affirmation of riyah, it must be established. Because some, again, we're talking about the one who didn't reject it, and never found Very big difference between, and some people may find a person who's doing ibadah and riyah comes to them. And it comes to many of us. That is different than the one who did, kept, went on with it. It's very important that we have to affirm that. Right? We can't just see, well, riyah was there and then it's all, this is no good. And then you go backwards, and especially if the action is already completed, and we're not talking about it, we're talking in, in relation to what we now we learn and we understand. We have to be very careful. It requires, obviously, more research, Allah, to find that line, Allah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.
Yes. When you have uh, yeah, and then you're trying to uh, overcome it by struggling, when do you know that you've actually overcome it? Well, that's the thing. As long as you didn't continue with those ideas, it means you didn't convince yourself that I'm going to keep going because everybody's watching me. I'm going to keep making this alone. You're just saying, no, nope, it's not. And inside yourself, you're trying to get that idea out of you. It means that this is what's intended. It's a type of struggle. Mujahid, you're in that feeling that you're trying to say, no, I'm doing for Allah. I'm not worried about the people. Then this is something, a good sign. So not the one who, when he realizes the people are praying behind him or that people are listening to the Qiraat, then he... He gets the idea or the feeling that it should increase in the beautification. And then he does it. Right? He, does, he doesn't even bother to. No, this is not the one. So it's very important to struggle against it as much as we can. Remind ourselves in the salah, yakin abudu, yakin astain, or in our heart, we're fighting against the ideas for Allah. And of course, Ibn Qayyim talks about this. Everyone's salah is not the same. Ibn Qayyim is that he talks about the five categories of salah. One of them is this person's struggle. Right? So they're struggling against shaitan, or struggling against the riyah, or struggling against shahawad, you have to concentrate. So this is important to continue struggling, not to be convinced that we'll just do it. This is very important, I didn't mention that. But the thing is like, uh, when somebody accepts that idea and does it, and for that, for that reason, then this is when we see Zuriya. Mm-hmm. Right, may Allah save us from it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned Khalidin of Hillad is abiding in hellfire forever. Mm-hmm. So does that mean uh, the, the person, the mu'min who kills the, the other mu'min uh, purposely, as Allah said, Khalid bin Finnar, does that mean he's in, in Hafai forever? The Ulama asked this ayah in Surah Al-Nisa about whoever, can man qatala mu'mina muta'ammidan. whoever kills the believer deliberately, then his position or abode is in Jahannam forever abiding there. And this is a threat, right? This is a text of Wa'id. And it's a difference between Wa'id and Wa'ad, means Allah's promise, Allah's threat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may threaten us in the Quran, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills to do whatever He wills. And the ulama mentions what he means by this is that a person won't be half fire forever. He means the eye is the tingus, but the Fasirin, when they explain the hadith, or explain the eye, like Ibn Abbas, and he's the final position on this, and the Sahaba, they mention that. The Rasulullah SAW mentioned even some narrations suggesting this, and what intends is to warn against it. But not that the correct opinion that he won't be half fire forever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah yafur dhulubu jami'ah. And other ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us. And Rasulullah SAW also talks about the person killing someone. And the person killed 99 men. And then he made tawbah Allah. After the 100, he went to Jannah. So, and Ibn Abbas, his latest fatwa was that he took the position that, that he can be forgiven. He will not be held to how far far. Even if he dies upon it, because Allah SWT can forgive him. And this is what seems to be, this is the correct opinion in regards to this one. So that wording there does not apply. Means if you use other evidences, does not intend that this meaning is that being being far forever. For these act, that act is the act of kufr. Act of kufr. An action kufr, but it doesn't mean that the person has five hours because the Ramah explained this with evidence that shows that the person will be forgiven. Whereas the other text will admit the person dies from a shirk in the kufr, then this is a, of a different category. For there's no text to convict it or abrogate it or of this nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's very important. Well, some people may hold the belief that a person will kill the Muslim and have five hours. And we say, no, this is not correct. It's not correct. These ayat will explain one another. So that's why we look at these two ayat. One in another one. Um, in this ayah. I believe this ayah is actually in uh, Surah Nisa. Yeah. This ayah is in the Al Ayah and Surah to Nisa likewise. Like, Allah Alam, yes. Uh, saying that somebody drives himself after taking a bath, and say that forearm touches a pipe, like, does there really break? This is something that, right, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he used to do that. Something, if he touches his pipe part, then he will break his wall. Right? So some of them say, is it the hand, the hand, like literally the hand? Allah say no, it's not the hand, it, or it includes anything that you touch with. And the hadith says, when the Quran, the hadith talks about the hand, whoever touches his private part of to Allah. So some mentioned it means the hand is intended here. And like literally, the hand, not the elbow, other than that. Allah a'lam, right? We obviously require more research, but it seems to be, Allah a'lam, what's intended by it is at the very least the hand, and then we should be so much more to find or the other opinions regarding that. But Ibn Umar used to be of this opinion that if he did touch it, his private part after it, also that he would do wudu again. Right, but I have to uh, check again if it was his elbow or his hand and this thing to Allah. Um, in regards to, you know, when you go to court, they tell you to raise your hand when you sign documents. Is that, is that falling to shirk? Well, that's the thing. Swearing about Allah is one thing. And then venerating in position like this, it requires research. But sometimes there are, like you said, positions in the court, even where you don't have the power. You don't have the you know, situation where you can even, uh, at times, have any say. 
happens. You might even have some situation where you have an opportunity. So this is something we should oppose to the Mashiach and Allah because it is different than a situation where someone doing willingly. Uh, the situation where you're coerced or more than that you are inspected or there will be more problems with Allah and should we oppose that to them or to find more research on Allah. Yeah, sometimes it comes to people, evil thoughts with spots from shaitan in regards to kufr, shit. It can happen to everybody, everyone who has iman. A shaitan will come to you sometimes and bring to you this or that. As a hayyib or hurayyib or hurayyib Muslim comes. A shaitan will come to you, shaitan yati ahadukum. He will come to one of you and say, man khalata ha kada wa kada, ma khalata kada wa kada, then he will reach the conclusion, had Allah man khalatahu. This is Allah who created him, a'udhu billah. So the Prophet said, when you come to this kind of thought, say, I'm to Allah, he will show you. I believe in Allah and His Messenger. So when you say that, it will deflect this. And what's important by this is that this kind of statement, so the statement, idea of Islam, comes out. So you know how the council will be deflected. And the Rasulullah said in the hadith that somebody is then held accountable for the, the statements that occur in somebody. He current us ourselves as long as we don't do two things act upon it or speak about it. So when these things come to us, with some shaitan, these evil thoughts, of kufr, we don't talk to, we don't tell people about it, or we don't speak about it, or we don't act upon it. We deflect them by seeing refuge in Allah, affirming Allah's oneness, tawheed, and the desire of the Messenger of Allah, and I'll go away. And also we benefit from that, it occurs to people who have iman. I mentioned before about the narration of Ibn Abbas or others, and the narration in the Sahihai, and the Sahih Muslim, the Sahih mentioned, some of them mentioned this to him. And when he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told me, I feel in this, some of this stuff will come to me. He said, that is the right? That's the clarity of that. That's the clarity of that. means that this, the fact that this doubt come to you means that your man is there intact and he's been deflecting it. So you deflect it and it won't be held accountable. Allah Alaihi Any other questions? Allah Alaihi Wasallam, Subhanakallah, Bihamdika, Shalom, La ilaha illa anta sakhratu ilaik.